Join is President Jiang Zemin, conducted by Mike Wallace of the CBS program 60 Minutes. First, you'll see and hear the interview as it premiered Sunday night on 60 Minutes. Then, immediately afterward, we'll show you the uncut interview with President Jiang, answering questions about human rights and religion, allegations of illegal campaign contributions to U.S. politicians, and other issues. This edited portion of the interview is about a half hour. In the 50 years since the Communist Party took power there, China has had just three paramount leaders, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and now Jiang Zemin, who currently rules over almost 1.3 billion people, one out of every five people on Earth. He has been in charge for 11 years since Deng chose him to restore stability after the brutality at Tiananmen Square. But still, Americans know remarkably little about this powerful man who arrives in New York City tomorrow to visit the UN and to meet with American business leaders. The president believes that China has been misunderstood here in America, and he wants Americans to get a more favorable, and he says, more realistic impression of his country. I hope to convey through your program my best wishes to American people. He's been called the silk wrap needle, and in this interview, you'll see why. For several years, we'd been asking to sit down with him. Finally, the president invited us to China and told us he was willing to answer any question. In a recent headline, in your government, or one of your government newspapers, China Daily, the, the paper called the U.S. a threat to world peace. Do you feel that way? that the United States is a threat to world peace. Inga Jimshaw. Candidly speaking, uh, maybe it is because of the economic power and leading edge in science and technology that the United States enjoys, that more often than not, it tends to overestimate itself and its position in the world. But today, I want to convey a nice message to the American people, so I don't want to use too many tough words in our talk. Al Gore, George W. Bush. One of them is going to be president of the United States, while you are president of China. If they are watching right now, what would you want to say to them about future U.S. relations with China? I have a lot of friends among the leaders of both parties, Republicans and Democrats. So you give money to both their campaigns? Are you just joking? We have never done such things. I have read the campaign platforms of both parties, and I believe whoever becomes president will try to improve the friendly relations between China and the United States, for this is in the strategic interest of the whole world. Someone asked me not to pay attention to unfriendly remarks candidates might make about China during the campaign, because once elected, they will be friendly. I only hope that's true. The president had agreed to give short answers so that we could cover more ground. And when I reminded him about it, he was ready for me. But I think my answer is roughly the same length as your question. I know it. I, that's absolutely true. If you make concise and brief questions, I'll give you brief answers. This was the first time Western television cameras had been allowed inside the president's summer compound on the beach at the resort town of Badaiha. It has been called China's Camp David. This is where the country's leaders meet in private every August to develop their plans for the coming year. The president agreed to speak candidly with us, so we asked him to tell us candidly. How would you characterize the state of relations between China and the United States today, Mr. President? On the whole, relations between China and the United States are good. However, I would like to use words people use to describe nature, to describe the state of China-U.S. relations. Our relations have experienced wind, rain, and sometimes clouds, or even dark clouds. However, sometimes it clears up. We all sincerely hope to build a constructive partnership between China and the United States. That's spoken like a real politician. There's no candor in it. I don't think politician is a very nice word. It's, it's a diplomatic word in this case. 
Jalzamin is a gregarious fellow who loves center stage. <laughs> but he has not given an extended interview to an American television reporter for ten years. Partly, he says, because Americans refuse to believe that the vast majority of Chinese are actually satisfied with one-party rule. One of our most spirited exchanges was over his objection to our use of the word dictator. You are the last major communist dictatorship in the world. You mean a um, dictatorship? <laughs> well, of course. A developmental dictatorship is what, is what we believe it is. Am I wrong? Of course. This is big mistake. You are, mm. it seems to me. Mm. A dictator, an authoritarian. No, but, but uh, I, I, very frank speaking, I don't agree with your point, I'm dictator. I know you don't. I, kn I know that you don't, but, but it, there's, an old, there's old <laughs> an old American phrase about if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and so forth, it's a duck. What means di di dictatorship? A dictator is somebody who forcibly, whether it's free press or free religion or free private enterprise, now you're, you're beginning to come a little closer to that. You, father knows best. And if you get in the way of father, father will take care of you. <laughs> Your way of describing what things are like in China is as absurd as what the Arabian Nights may sound like. The National People's Congress selects the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and the Central Committee has a Politburo, and the Politburo has a standing committee of which I am a member. And no decision is made unless all members agree. But when we talk about dictatorship, I'm, I'm wagging my finger at the president of China. <laughs> you know what? When I see the picture of that one young man in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, that to me means Chinese dictatorship. That's a wonderful symbol that hits hits me in my heart mm. about dictatorship in China. I don't need translation. I know, I know. what you say. <laughs> I'm very willing to answer these questions. So we reminded him that he himself had been a student demonstrator more than 50 years ago. You were a student protester in Shanghai. In Shanghai, that's right. Mm. At the time of the uh, nationalists, we want freedom. We want democracy. That was you. That's right. That's what those people in Tiananmen Square were saying. We want freedom. We want democracy. In the 1989 disturbance, we truly understood the passion of students who were calling for greater democracy and freedom. In fact, we have always been working to improve our system of democracy. But we could not possibly allow people with ulterior motives to use the students to overthrow the government under the pretext of democracy and freedom. Did a part of you admire his courage? He was never arrested. I don't know where he is now. Looking at the picture, I know he definitely had his own ideas. You haven't answered the question, Mr. President. Did did a part of Zhang Zemin admire admire his courage? I know what you are driving at, but what I want to emphasize is that we fully respect every citizen's right to freely express his wishes and desires. But I do not favor any flagrant opposition to government actions during an emergency. The tank stopped and did not run the young man down. I'm not talking about the tank. I'm talking about that man's heart, that man's courage, that man, that lonely man, standing against that. One month after Tiananmen, you wrote a speech, and in it you said, corruption is growing in the soil. If all our party and our government organs use their power to seek material benefits, 
Isn't this just like fleecing the people in broad daylight? Those students in Tiananmen had also been protesting against the corruption that you talked about. So apparently they did have some effect on you and on your party. I hate corruption. You are right that during the 1989 disturbance, students were chanting slogans against corruption. So on this specific point, the party shares the same position as the students. As an aside, and to underline his credentials as a student demonstrator in times past, the president himself sang a protest song that he'd used back in 1943 against Japanese troops who were occupying parts of China. The title, Arise Fellow Students to Defend the Motherland. The president's aide suggested it would be unfair to show pictures of the violence at Tiananmen Square because they say Jiang Zemin had nothing to do with it. But they were glad to give us pictures of their embassy in Belgrade which had been demolished by American bombers during NATO's air war last year. Mr. President, do you still believe that the United States bombed your embassy in Belgrade on purpose? Let me put it the other way around. The United States has state-of-the-art technology. So all the explanations that they have given us for what they call a mistaken bombing are absolutely unconvincing. What would the United States get out of bombing your embassy in Belgrade? So is that for me also a question? The identification marks of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade were too clear for people to miss. So why has there been such an incident? It is still a question. But we have decided to look forward to improve China-U.S. relations. I understand that, and that's behind us. But you know it's possible for the CIA and the Pentagon to make mistakes, stupid mistakes. <laughs> the American people, the American people have no doubt, no doubt in their mind, I think, that this was simply a mistake. He Clinton Jiang President Clinton apologized to me for the bombing many times on the telephone. I told him, since you represent Americans, and I Chinese, it would be impossible for us to reach total agreement on this issue. When 60 Minutes returns, the president will give us his views on Abraham Lincoln, American morals, and accused spy Dr. Wen Ho Li. President Jiang Zemin says his polls tell him the Chinese people believe that one party rule is the best way to maintain stability and increase prosperity. And while the president is 74 and scheduled to step down in less than three years, he has indicated that he might stay on beyond that. His unfulfilled dream, of course, is to unite Taiwan with the mainland. And he told us that he would fly to Taiwan himself for unification talks if Taiwan were to agree in advance that it is part of China, which so far Taiwan has been unwilling to do. We asked the president about that Taiwan-born scientist who's become a source of some controversy in the United States and China. You know the name of Dr. Wen Ho Li. Do you know the man? I, I know famous scientist. Famous scientist. Chinese. Chinese? Overseas Chinese. Hmm? Overseas Chinese. <laughs> oh, overseas Chinese. He went to the United States in 1964 and had a, a, a wonderful career and went to Los Alamos National Laboratory and suddenly they decided that he was a spy conceivably for you. Was he? I can tell you frankly, China was not in any way involved in Wen Ho Li's case. But we do know that he is a scientist who came here to China and talked to your scientists. That's nothing strange. It's just as normal as some Chinese scientist traveling abroad. Allow me to quote a Chinese proverb which goes, if you are out to condemn someone, 
you can always trump up a charge. We don't know what political motives are behind it. Today, the Chinese still see Wen Ho Li as a renowned scientist. That's all. That's all. Not a spy. <laughs> of course, I... Uh, <laughs> you seem almost defensive. For the first time in this whole conversation, when I raised the name of Wen Ho Li, all of a sudden I, I sensed this is a difficult subject for you. No, 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 and a difficulty <laughs> to me. <laughs> This is your feeling. <laughs> Correct. Maybe under the lights. <laughs> Conceivably, <laughs> under the lights. But uh, what do you think? I'm not the supposed to think. Even who is a spy, Chinese spy or not? Do I think? That's right. You were considered carefully. I'm, I am considering very carefully. You've stopped me. Uh, no. no. <laughs> First time I discovered you faced the difficulty to answer this question. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I probably shouldn't answer. If there was ever a time to change the subject, this was it. You studied the speeches of Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln as a youngster? When you were learning English? When I was in middle school. And later, when I was a teacher, I used Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in my course. Uh, do you want me to quote some lines from it? I do indeed. I will tell you, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to a proposition that all men are created equal. Why did you learn that by heart? I focused on the words, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. Right. Because this had a great influence on students when I was young. And I think what Abraham Lincoln described still remains the goal of American leaders today. It's true. Especially the last paragraph, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people never push from those. But Abraham Lincoln was elected by the people. Uh, correct? That's right. Why is it that Americans can elect their national leaders, but you apparently don't trust the Chinese people to elect your national leaders? Why? I am also an elected leader, though we have a different electoral system. Each country should have its own system because our countries have different cultures and historic traditions and different levels of education and economic development. Zhang was chosen by the top leaders of the Communist Party. Public elections occur only in some villages and small towns. and Candidates must either be members of the Communist Party or run as independents. But I don't understand still why you have a one-party state. What would happen? What would happen in China if there were two or three parties? Isn't it conceivable that, as in the United States, the competition between the parties to represent the majority of the people in that country make for a better country? Why must we have opposition parties? You are trying to apply the American values and the American political system to the whole world. But that is not very wise. Many China scholars believe the president has in effect made a deal with the Chinese people to increase their economic and social freedom, to work and live as they please, and in return the people give up any right to challenge the authority of the Communist Party. But the president doesn't see it that way. He told us the people and the party are working together toward mutual goals. Let me be frank. China and the United States differ greatly in terms of our values. You Americans always use your values in making judgments about the political situation in other countries. We want to learn from the West about science and technology and how to manage the economy. But this must be combined with specific conditions here. That's how we have made great progress in the last 20 years. Fact is, China's standard of living has been rising dramatically. 
And in China, like America, it's the economy that largely determines people's satisfaction with their government. The president maintains that the vast majority here believe strong one-party rule is the best way to hold this huge population together and to keep the economy growing. So stability is the top priority, sometimes at the expense of human rights. New subject, one you're not going to want to talk about. Human rights. You persecute something called Falun Gong. They do exercises, they believe in a certain spiritual life. What, what is it that worries you so about Falun Gong that you torture, arrest, kill, etc.? What, what is it? I will tell you. Their leader, Li Hongji, claims to be the reincarnation of the chief Buddha and also a reincarnated Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? He said that doomsday was about to come and that the earth was going to explode. In fact, what he says are just fallacies to deceive people. But as a result of his preaching, many families were broken and many lives were lost. So, after careful deliberations, we concluded that Falun Gong is an evil cult. A cult. Cult. By the way, no Falun Gong followers have ever been sentenced to death. But 26 of them have reportedly died in police custody. President Zhang told us Falun Gong has driven thousands of its members to commit suicide. But Falun Gong says that's ridiculous, that it does not encourage suicide, and that it's still going strong despite the Chinese government's efforts to quash it. Look, you have persecuted Christians, it's well known. You have persecuted Falun Gong. It is difficult to understand why a big power like China would want to persecute people because of their religion. One thing we have to make very clear. Just now, you mixed up two things, Christianity and Falun Gong. Under China's constitution, people have the freedom of religious belief. But Falun Gong is a cult. It is totally different from Christianity. But you will acknowledge then that Christians have been persecuted by the Communist Party in China, yes? No. No. But like anyone else, Christians should not break Chinese laws. The government does recognize Christianity Chinese style. But foreign missionaries are banned and evangelical groups are not allowed to spread their faith without government approval. As for freedom of speech, criticism of the government can get you arrested. And Jiang Zemin has always favored tough government controls of the press. The press, he has said, should be a mouthpiece of the party. And there is not freedom of the press here. There is not. We see a connection between freedom of the people and freedom of the press. What do you fear from a free press? <laughs> I think all countries and parties must have their own publications to publicize their ideas. We do have freedom of the press, but such freedom should be subordinate to and serve the interest of the nation. How can you allow such freedom to damage the national interests? You have blocked internet sites here in China, the BBC, the Washington Post. Why? Why block an internet site? You don't trust the people somehow to be able to pick stuff up off the internet and learn? We hope people will learn a lot of useful things from the internet. However, sometimes there is also unhealthy material, especially pornography on the internet, which does great harm to our youngsters. Not from the BBC and not from the Washington Post. They might be banned because of some of their political news reports. We need to be selective. We hope to restrict as much as possible information not conducive to China's development. Deng Xiaoping said to get rich is glorious. Is it conceivable that the more material gains that we make as human beings, the more we become hedonists, permissive? 
What Deng Xiaoping advocated does allow some people to become rich before others. But the ultimate objective is prosperity for all. A common problem for world leaders is to avoid material wealth on one hand, but moral decline on the other. Do you think that America is, is more decadent, for instance, than China? and that we are exporting our decadence to you? Let me put it this way. Due to many differences between our countries in historical traditions, ways of life, religious beliefs, etc., things you don't regard as decadent in the States, we may regard as decadent in China. That's why we have to be very selective. So that is this very complicated problem. <laughs> Another complicated problem is trade. And President Zhang will meet with American business leaders this week to urge them to increase their investments in China. Corporate America has long lusted after customers in China's billion buyer market. But the fact is China still sells a lot more to us than we sell to them. To change that, the White House says that if the U.S. Senate approves permanent normal trade relations with China, as the House already has, that would force China to reduce tariffs and trade barriers and thus to buy more American goods. President Zhang wants normal trade relations too. And he wanted to end our conversation by underscoring why he had agreed to this rarest of interviews. I'm convinced that this interview will be further promoting the friendship and the mutual understanding between our two peoples. That's all. You believe that? That's right. I'm convinced that. I trust that. You admire America. That's right. And you want to be friends. I want to promote the mutual understanding between two peoples. Now the uncut version of the 60 Minutes interview with Chinese President Jiang Zemin. In this hour-long interview conducted by Mike Wallace, President Zhang answered questions about human rights and religion, allegations of illegal campaign contributions to U.S. politicians, and other issues. Time flies very fast. Yeah. We met for the first time in 1986. You and I. That's right. When... I was mayor of Shanghai. That's great. Mm. It was on um, a roof, out of doors. Near out of doors, near the Huangpu River. Exactly. Mm. exactly. And uh, I'm very happy to meet you again today. And I, you, and I thank you very much for granting us this interview. I hope to convey through your program my best wishes to American people. That you and to your friend President Clinton, and to your friend George Bush? That's for, of course, including everybody, because m <laughs> I have many, many friends in America. I know right. that. All friends. I know that. Uh, you know, Mr. President, you took over a little bit more than 10 years ago, right? Widely perceived to be a transitional figure. You were not going to be number one. You were, you were going to spend a few years running the country, and then somebody more decisive and somebody stronger and so forth was going to uh, take over. But you confounded the skeptics. You took charge, and you're still very much in charge. Why do you believe that perhaps you were underestimated? Well, you know, Many statesmen in the world have moved up gradually. I was the mayor, and then the party secretary in Shanghai. In fact, I did not think that I would be transferred to the Central Committee here in Beijing. But finally, I was the man who was selected. Deng Xiaoping and other leaders of the older generation wanted me to become General Secretary of the Communist Party. I did not expect this. However, I've been in this position for 11 years. And I've always held the conviction that I need to do my very best to serve my country and my motherland. And maybe it was because of my hard work and my diligence that I still have the job. The, the shorter answers 
You know the United States. Shorter answers, please. More concise. Three, <laughs> but I think my answer is roughly the same length as your question. I know it. I, that's absolutely true. Three, three, three. If you make concise and brief questions, I'll give you brief answers. You are called by some the silk-wrapped needle. Is that one reason for your success? Or what does it mean? Well, the shing. People use the same phrase to describe the character of Zhang Xiaoping. I don't think I should be put on a par with Zhang. But one thing for myself is that, for sure, is that I am a decisive figure. But that also would seem to mean you're a tough figure, a needle. In fact, a needle wrapped in silk is a very high compliment in Chinese, so I think I should be more modest. Outside, we talked about relations between the United States and China. In a few words, how would you characterize the state of relations between China and the United States today, Mr. President? On the whole, relations between China and the United States are good. However, I would like to use words people use to describe nature, to describe the state of China-U.S. relations. Our relations have experienced wind, rain, and sometimes clouds, or even dark clouds. However, sometimes it clears up. We all sincerely hope to build a constructive partnership between China and the United States. I have spoken like a real politician. There's no candor in it. In a recent headline, in your government, or one of your government newspapers, China Daily, the paper called the U.S. a threat to world peace. Do you feel that way? That the United States is a threat to world peace? I don't think a politician is a complimentary word. No, it's not a, a nice word. It's, it's, uh, Still it's, a, it's a diplomatic word in this case. In other words, look, either you believe that the United States is a threat to world peace, or you do not. Which is it? And, and if so, in what way are we a threat to world peace? That was the headline when Defense Secretary William Cohen came here to China. I have a lot of friends in the United States, both Democrats and Republicans. And every time I have meetings with them, we exchange views in great candor and great frankness. So candidly speaking, maybe it is because of the strong economic power and the leading edge in science and technology that the United States enjoys that more often than not it tends to overestimate itself and its position in the world. Today, I want to convey a friendly message to the American people. But I do want to say that there may be a certain touch of hegemonism in the leadership of the United States. That same newspaper said that the United States is power mad. I quote, power mad. Well, as I said to you earlier, I hope that through our talk today, I will be able to convey a message of friendship and mutual understanding between the Chinese and the American people. So if you permit, I would like to refrain from using too many tough words in our conversation. I think I made myself very clear when I said that the United States enjoyed a developed economy and also a leading edge in science and technology. This has put you in a rather advantageous position and very often makes you feel more equal than the rest of the world. You mean we look down at China? We are too prominent in Asia? Well, I am not talking about the United States' attitude toward China in particular. China is a country with 5,000 years of history and also more than 1.2 billion people. We have accumulated a significant economic foundation over the past 20 years of reform and opening up. So I'm afraid the United States simply cannot afford to look down on China. Understood. Let me, if I may, you studied the speeches of Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln as a youngster when you were learning English? In fact, I was in middle school. And later, when I was a teacher in the night school in Shanghai, I also selected Lincoln's Gettysburg Address as part of my course. And maybe you want me to quote some lines from that speech. I do indeed. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, 
conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Why, why did you learn that by heart? I'm particularly interested in the phrase, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. Because this was a great influence on the students when I was in middle school. And I think what Abraham Lincoln described in his article still remains the goal of American leaders today. Especially the last paragraph, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, never push from others. But Abraham Lincoln was elected by the people, uh, right? That's right. Why is it that Americans can elect their national leaders, but you apparently don't trust the Chinese people to elect your national leaders? Why? I also believe that I am an elected leader, although we use different ways of election. The only difference between China and the United States on this specific question is the different systems of election that we use in our two countries. Because China has its own historical tradition, its own level of education, of economic development and social development and so on. So I think each country should have its own individual system of election. Of course. But I don't understand still why you have a one-party state. What would happen? What would happen in China if there were two? or three parties. Isn't it conceivable that, as in the United States, the competition between the parties to represent the majority of the people in that country make for a better country? Why is it necessary to have opposition parties? It shows that you don't understand Chinese history. Americans think the whole world should adopt American values and the American political system. I don't think that is wise. It's not the American, it is the British, it is the German, it is the French, it is, I mean, it, it's all over the world. You are the last major dictatorship, the, the last major communist dictatorship in the world. You mean I'm dictatorship? Well, of course. A developmental dictatorship is what, <laughs> is what we believe it is. Am I wrong? Of course, this is big mistake. Big mistake. Of course. This, this shows you don't know China that well. Oh, I don't know China that well. Yeah, I've been here yeah. half a dozen times. What means dictatorship? Dictatorship? When you do not have freedom of the press. And there is not freedom of the press here. There is not. That's a perfect example. You mean China, there's not... Here, 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 uh, in China, yes. China. We see a connection between freedom of the people and freedom of the press. You have said the press should be the mouthpiece of the party. You've also said, as Mao Zedong did, newspapers must be run by politicians. What do you fear from a free press? I think for any individual country or any individual party, they always have their own publications to promote their own ideology. As I explained to you, the Chinese system is a multi-party system led by the Communist Party. And we do have freedom of the press. We have over 2,000 TV stations in the country. We have more than 2,000 local newspapers and more than 8,000 magazines. We publish more than 100,000 new books each year. Even Mao Zedong advocated the policy of allowing 100 different flowers to bloom and 100 different sorts of schools of thought to contend in the field of art and literature. Let 100 flowers bloom. Ah, that's right. And that was a disaster. But the direction was right. Even today, we still pursue the same direction. Well, look, four years ago, Mr. President, you went to People's Daily, which is the real paper here. And you said the following, you said, just one article, one erroneous remark, or one mistake in the press may lead to political instability. Is the press that powerful? That makes, that makes your one-party rule seem remarkably uh, precarious.
You were right in saying that I did make a visit with the People's Daily back four years ago, but I'm afraid I never put things that way. So there may have been certain distortions about what I really said. What I want to explain to you is that we are such a big country with a population of over 1.2 billion that the direction our media tries to lead our country toward is important. You cannot possibly try to use the American values to make judgments about China because you are highly developed in your economy and your level of education. You cannot possibly try to make China the same as the United States. I think for both the Chinese media and the foreign media, one thing is very important. They should never distort the facts, though they are free to have their own opinions. This is very important for the Chinese media, particularly the People's Daily, because it is the major newspaper for the Chinese people. If there is a mistake in the newspaper, people will believe what they read. The situation is different from yours. You can report any story any way you want. Even if you make a mistake in your newspaper, it won't have serious consequences. For example, I I'm here right now, talking to you in Beidahe. I've read some foreign papers that say I'm in Dalian right now. If this report were true, how could I possibly be sitting here talking to you? And I will tell you another thing. A few months ago, I read a piece of news from the Internet saying that while Jiang Zemin was visiting the army in Xiamen, there was a very serious explosion, and Jiang Zemin was severely hurt and hospitalized. However, at that time, I was in Beijing. Look, that, that you're absolutely right. There are mistakes made in your press, in our press, and so forth. But when we talk about dictatorship, I, I'm, I'm wagging my finger at the president of China. <laughs> I hope you will not send me off to... Uh, uh, Why? Your press, uh, your press and our press both make mistakes. But their influence is greater. Well, we're a quarter of a billion. We're, uh, we're a only about one-fifth the population of China. And, and I want to get to this business about your running the lives of 1.3 billion people, one out of every five people on Earth. That's extraordinary. Do you, do you never say to yourself at home, do you ever say, Shang Zemin, I, I am the chief of one out of every five people on Earth. Let me say about the Chinese population. Every day, 52,000 babies are born in our country. This will add up to 20 million a year. And this significant growth of our population has been seen under a very strict family planning policy. So I often ask myself how to ensure a happy life and constantly improve living standards for the 1.2 billion Chinese people. This is indeed a very tough job. At the very beginning of your rule, if we want to call it there, here in China, <coughs> when Deng Xiaoping said to you, I want you to be at the core, I want you to be the man who leads, you are quoted as having said, I feel as though I am on thin ice. Not that you were afraid, but surely you must have wondered whether you were ready to take on the responsibility. Well, let me be very frank with you. Before coming to Beijing, I was the number one in Shanghai, the party secretary. I had no intention of leading the whole country. And I hoped that a more capable candidate would take the job. But Deng Xiaoping and other leaders from the older generation believed I was the appropriate candidate. So I was elected to be the general secretary of the Communist Party. Now I can only devote myself to do everything I can to serve my country and my people until the last minute of my life. Well, of course, but, but, you had never served in the armed forces of China, right? Correct. One of the most important parts of your job. You're the chairman of the Central Military Commission of the Military, right? Military Committee. Military Committee. A man who has never served in the armed forces, like Bill Clinton. You have been 
tough on the army. Haven't you? Uh, you were right. I never served in the army in the military because I am an intellectual. In the United States, intellectuals serve in the army, Mr. President. That's true. Having said that, though, I have served as chairman of the Central Military Commission for 11 years. I think I have the confidence of the army. As chairman, I don't personally need to fire a gun or fly an airplane. My responsibility is to make strategic decisions. Well, you made a very serious decision. The army, the armed forces, used to be in business. Oh, this is my decision. I know it. Two years ago, two years ago, you said to the army, out of business. You are the army. You are not business people. Why? I think if the army is allowed to do business, then that would erode our army. Because history has taught us that any army that is allowed to engage in business eventually becomes corrupted. And that would destroy the morale and the fighting will of the military. You raise the subject of corruption. One month after Tiananmen, one, after, one month after that episode, you wrote a speech. And in it you said, Corruption is growing in the soil, in the air, in the nooks and crannies. If all our party and our government organs use their power to seek material benefits, isn't this just like fleecing the people in broad daylight? Those students in Tiananmen had also been protesting against the corruption that you talked about. So apparently they did have some effect on you and on your party. I think corruption is a historical phenomenon in that it happened in different countries in ancient times, and it still happens in different countries today. We have been fighting resolutely against corruption. There have been very serious corruption cases in our country. I hate corruption very much, but I don't think the problem can be solved overnight. And in order to gradually eradicate the problem, we need to depend on our legal system, on our media, and also on improved education. You were right that during the disturbance of 89, some students were chanting slogans against corruption. So on this specific point, the party shares the same position with the students. But the fact is that there were some people with ulterior motives who were trying to use the enthusiasm of the students to overthrow the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and overthrow the socialist government. This will never be allowed. So we had to take resolute measures. And had we not done so, we would not have the nationwide stability that we have today, a stability that benefits China and the rest of the world. You were a student protester in Shanghai. Shanghai, that's right. At the time of the nationalists, we want freedom, we want democracy. That was you. That's right. And that's what those folks... That's what those people in Tiananmen Square were saying. We want freedom. We want democracy. I first joined the student movement against the Japanese military in China. Then after World War II, we were against the nationalist regime. Because back then, there was no freedom and democracy in the country. But ever since the People's Republic of China was founded, we've always been working to further promote democracy in our country. Even in the 1989 disturbance, as I told you before, we could understand the passions of students who were calling for greater democracy and freedom. And we, in fact, have always been working constantly up until today to improve our system of democracy. And the crux of the matter was that we could not possibly allow those people with ulterior motives to use the student movement to overthrow the government. One more question about dictatorship. That's right. You bring up the Internet. You have blocked Internet sites here in China. The BBC, the Washington Post. Why? Why block an Internet site? You don't trust the people somehow to be able to pick stuff up off the Internet and learn? Well, about this Internet. I think we discussed this issue before, when we were talking about freedom of the press. We hope that we can learn a lot of useful things and useful information from the Internet. 
However, sometimes there is also unhealthy stuff, especially pornography on the internet, which does great harm to our youngsters. Not from the BBC and not from the Washington Post. As for examples you have given, such as BBC and the others, they might be banned because of some of their political news reports. We need to be selective. We hope to restrict as much as possible information not conducive to China's development. New subject, one you're not going to want to talk about. Human rights. You persecute Christians. You persecute something called Falun Gong. What in the world? For what reason this spiritual undertaking according to my understanding. And I have met the man in New York. What was his name? Lee Lee Hung. Lee Hung. I met him. You met him? Yes, I sat down with him in like this. Mm. Like this. And they do exercises. They believe in a certain spiritual life. What, what is it that worries you so about Falun Gong that you torture, arrest, kill, etc. What, what is it? At first I would like to ask you, you also trust the Falun Gong? Trust them? I, I don't know enough about them. I will tell you. Li Hongji claims to be the reincarnation of the chief Buddha and also a reincarnated Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? He said that doomsday was about to come. And he also said that the earth was going to explode. He also claims that I and Mr. Li Peng, who then was the premier, used to call him on the telephone, asking him to delay the date of the explosion of the earth, maybe for several decades. But we had never talked to him. Well, by making all these claims, he wants to achieve nothing but people's trust, people's belief in him. He wants to uh, create the impression that he knows the Chinese leaders very well. In fact, what he says are just misleading words. In fact, as a result of his preachings, many families were broken and many lives were lost. So, after careful deliberations, we draw the conclusion that Falun Gong is a cult. Look, you have persecuted Christians, it's well known. You have persecuted Falun Gong. It's, it's difficult, it is difficult to understand why a big power like China would want to persecute people because of their religion. One thing we have to make clear. Just now, you mixed up two things, Christianity and Falun Gong. Under China's constitution, the Chinese people have the freedom of religious beliefs, including the freedom to believe in Christianity. But Falun Gong is a cult. It is totally different from Christianity. When I was a college student, I sometimes attended Christmas Eve parties. But, but you will acknowledge then that Christians have been persecuted by the Communist Party in China, yes? No. No. Um, but like anyone else, Christians should not break Chinese laws. Move to something else. Uh, you know the name of Dr. Wen Ho Lee. Do you know the man? I, I know famous scientist. Famous scientist. Mm -hmm. Chinese. Chinese? Overseas Chinese. Hmm? Overseas Chinese. <laughs> oh, overseas Chinese. He went to the United States in 1964. Okay and had a, a, a wonderful career and went to Los Alamos National Laboratory and suddenly they decided that he was a spy conceivably for you. Was he? I can tell you frankly, China was not in any way involved in Wen Ho Li's case. We only know about Wen Ho Li as a well-known scientist. Who came here to China and talk to your scientists. Very natural. This is just natural for him to come and visit us and to talk uh, with the Chinese scientists. Just as normal as some Chinese scientists who also travel abroad. Well, I am by no means trying to defend Win Ho Li. He can defend himself. 
However, allow me to quote a Chinese proverb which says that if you are about to condemn someone, you can always trump up a charge. We don't know what political motives are behind it. I will tell you an example. A very, very famous scientist, Einstein. He invented the theory of relativity. Right. That's right. In 1905 and 1916. In 20th century, if no quantum theory, no relative theory, it, it will be no atomic bomb. Okay. But Einstein, I'm convinced that Einstein, he didn't like to use his theory to make the bomb, you know. So I don't think it's appropriate for people to think that exchanges among scientists should have a problem unless some people were trying to achieve some political purpose. Up until today, the Chinese still see Wen Ho Li as a very well-renowned scientist. That's all. That's all. Not a spy. <laughs> of course, I... <laughs> you seem almost defensive for the first time in this whole conversation when I raised the name of Wen Ho Li, all of a sudden I, I sensed this is a difficult subject for you. And none other have I, have I felt that way. No, 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 and that difficulty <laughs> to me. <laughs> this is your feeling. <laughs> Correct. Maybe under the lights. <laughs> Conceivably, <laughs> under the lights. The reason I ask about Wen Ho Li is because I, I met him and found him. But uh, what do you think? I'm not the supposed to think. even who is a spy, a Chinese spy or not? Do I think? That's right. You were considered carefully. I'm, I am considering very carefully because my, I don't have all of the information perhaps that somebody else does. But, but you've asked and I will answer. You, you have the information maybe much more than I. No. Well, I own it from the newspaper. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but I think I don't. Uh, I, but I uh, think first time I. <laughs> you've stopped me. No. no. Yeah. First time I discovered you faced the difficulty to answer this question. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I probably shouldn't answer because <laughs> I am a dispassionate reporter, an objective reporter. One more question. His attorney says that Dr. Wen Holy was singled out for prosecution simply because he was a Chinese-American. Does that make any sense to you? I think I've already said everything I want to say about the Wen Ho Li case. I hope the United States will not have any racial discrimination in handling such cases, and that instead it will follow the principle that all men are created equal, as advocated by Abraham Lincoln. That makes you a Republican. <laughs> I don't side with any individual political party in the United States, because I have many friends in both parties. Anyway. I'm a member of the Communist Party of China. Is this the Chinese equivalent of Camp David, Bedaya? It is our tradition to move our offices here every summer. But in fact, we're not having a vacation here because we conduct our normal business as we do in Beijing. Except here we may go for a swim. My doctor often suggests that I should swim. I swam this morning for the 21st time this summer. It's the tradition for Chinese leaders to swim. Mao Zedong swam, Deng Xiaoping swam, Zhang Zemin. <laughs> Who's going to be your successor, and is, he, and is he a swimmer? That may be a coincidence that we all swam, but it is true that swimming makes you feel relaxed and refreshed. Four years ago, here in Bedaya, you called together a group of scholars and historians to discuss the moral crisis in China, problems that we face in the West as well. The death of morals, the disintegration of traditional values. Still going on, is it? Yes. Could this be a, the result 
of to get rich is glorious. Deng Xiaoping said to get rich is glorious. And all of a sudden, people began. That's when, that's when you started your capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, is, it, is it conceivable that the more material gains that we make as human beings, the more we become hedonists, permissive? You may be right about the timing. It was maybe four years ago. In fact, this question is a frequently discussed topic for us. China is a nation with a long history, and we have always attached great importance to spiritual civilization and moral integrity. And the theory of building socialism with Chinese characteristics as advocated by Deng Xiaoping does allow certain people in some areas to become rich first. But the ultimate objective is to achieve common prosperity. To get rich is glorious, is not capitalism. Socialism is to make all the people rich and prosperous and to make their country strong and prosperous. In February, I visited part of the Guangdong province where I said to the people there, that you are richer than some other parts of China and you need to think about the source of your wealth and you should build on your prosperity and not just sit back and enjoy what you have achieved. I think the last thing world leaders want to see is the scenario where you have material wealth on one hand but moral decline on the other. But you yourself, Mr. President, you yourself have urged people, I quote, to filter out decadent Western influences. Which, which decadent Western influences are you talking about, Mr. President? Uh, I'm afraid I can't give you a clearer answer about this decadence than you can, because I have not lived in the United States. For example, Las Vegas. I've never been there, but I've seen it on moving pictures. I and the American leaders, including former Presidents Bush and Carter, and the current President Clinton, are all worried about the influence of decadence on the morals of young people. You know, I'm sure, Mr. President, that you know that virtually every good Hollywood film is passed around here in China. Uh, that's said to be one of the gaps between you and the, and the party and the people of China. They welcome it. You want to keep them out. Is it because the Chinese people are decadent? We don't have any objections to Western films. In fact, I am also a viewer of the Western movies. When I was a college student, I loved A Song to Remember, Waterloo Bridge, Bathing Beauty, and How Green Was My Valley. I've seen many American and European films. But we're talking about decadence. We're talking... Do you think that America is, is more decadent, for instance, than China, and that we are exporting our decadence to you? Uh, well, about decadence. Our two countries may be different in terms of historical tradition, way of life, and the religious beliefs, etc. So maybe there are things that you don't regard as decadent in the United States that are regarded as decadent in China. That's why we have to be very selective. For instance, Titanic was a big hit in China. And I watched the film. I also saw Gladiator and Forrest Gump. For instance, the movie called Gladiator describes a part of history in the Roman Empire. Uh, there may be a slight deviation from the historical truth, uh, but this is something we fully understand. It is an artistic creation. Al Gore, George W. Bush, one of them is going to be president of the United States while you are president of China. If they are watching right now, what would you want to say to them about future U.S. relations with China? Serious question. As I said to you earlier, I have a lot of good friends within the leadership of the two parties and many members of the two parties. So you give money to both their campaigns? Are you joking? We have never done such things. I believe that whoever becomes president will try to improve the friendly relations between China and the United States. This is in the strategic interest of the whole world. Someone asked me not to believe any unfriendly remarks candidates might make about China because once elected, they will be friendly. I only hope that's true. 
Well, that's what Bill Clinton did. He made unfriendly remarks about China. And after he was elected, he became quite different about China, didn't he? You know that. Many people believe, Mr. President, that you have made a deal, you and your party, with the people of China. You give them economic freedom, social freedom, to work, live, where and how they want. Traveling. And in exchange, they give up any right to challenge the authority of the Communist Party. That's about it, yes? Let me be frank with you. I think China and the United States differ greatly in terms of our values. You Americans always use your own values and logic in making judgments about the specific situations or, say, political situation of other countries. The American values emphasize deal-making. But what we value most is a good collective where people support and assist each other. You also have mutual support in your country, but our perception of the word deal is different from yours in the West. The purpose and principles of the Communist Party are to serve the people. In this process, we win the trust and confidence of our people. Since the founding of the People's Republic, we have traveled through twists and turns in our decades of developing the nation. The policy of reform and opening up initiated by Deng Xiaoping was a great success. So now, we are building in China, socialism with Chinese characteristics. But people in the West always hope that China can become a capitalist country. But with only one system around, would the world be a very dull place? I still believe the world should be a diverse and colorful one. We want to learn from the Western world everything advanced and progressive, including science and technology, and its experience in managing the economy. Of course, this must be combined with specific conditions here. And it is exactly because we have been following these principles that we have scored great achievements in the past few decades. This, goes, this follows the business about the United States being power mad. Uh, if the United States were to go ahead with the missile system that President Clinton has talked about, would China respond by building more missiles? I think it's just normal for China to gradually strengthen our capability for national defense. That's it, because you complain bitterly about the possibility of a, of a expanded missile defense by the United States. That's when you began to talk about our being, or somebody, your newspapers began to talk about our being power mad and uh, not interested in peace and so forth. We are opposed to a national missile defense and theater missile defense plans. We are unambiguous about this. Because? Because that would create an atmosphere where people cannot possibly engage in the effort to achieve the common task of peace and development. Our national security interests must not be impaired in any way. Your missile defense may naturally be perceived by people as a kind of threat. A threat against whom? It is a threat against us. For instance, we are worried about the possibility of Taiwan being incorporated into a U.S.-Japan missile defense system. You've said that you want to improve relations with the United States, yes? Okay. What would you do to improve relations with the United States, Mr. President? Most importantly, the leaders of both countries should scale a greater height and adopt a long-term perspective. We need to stand high and look far. And in fact... When I was having my very first meeting with President Clinton in 1993, I quoted the Chinese lines, to have a grander sight, you must scale a great height. And when Vice President Gore traveled to China, I also quoted some lines from the Song Dynasty. It goes, I do not fear that floating clouds might block my view because I am standing on the highest peak. The United States is a much younger country compared with China. So maybe you have fewer historical burdens, and your people demonstrate an innovative, pioneering spirit. You are? You are, mm. it seems to me. Mm. A dictator, an authoritarian. No, but, but uh, I, I, very frank speaking, I don't agree with your point, I'm dictator. I know you don't. I, kn I know that you don't, but, but, <laughs> but uh, 
But people, there's an old, there's old, <laughs> an old American phrase about if it walks like a duck and 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 quacks like a duck and so forth, it's a duck. A dictator is somebody who forcibly, whether it's free press or free religion or free private enterprise, now you're, you're beginning to come a little closer to that. You, father knows best. And if you get in the way of father, father will take care of you. That's what a dictator is, in effect, politically. I think your way of describing what things are like here in China is as absurd as what the Arabian Nights may sound like. The reality in China is that we have leadership by the Communist Party. According to law, the party only makes recommendations. Everything needs to be approved by the National People's Congress. By the National People's Congress. Of course. Darren all of whom are members of the party. No. And all of the ministers. Their nominations are approved by the National People's Congress and also the leadership of the State Council. So the State Council looks after the day-to-day -day business of the country. The supreme power of the Communist Party lies with the National Congress. And the National Congress chooses the Central Committee. And the Central Committee has a Politburo. The Politburo has a Standing Committee of which I am a member. So every week the Standing Committee members have a meeting. And the meeting is held in an open, democratic atmosphere. When one member of the Standing Committee has an objection, I will not make a decision. Look, one last question. Dictatorship. You know what? When I see the picture of that one young man in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, that to me means Chinese dictatorship. That's a wonderful symbol that hits, hits me in my heart about dictatorship in China. I don't need translation. I know, I know. what you say. <laughs> I'm very willing to answer these questions because Barbara Walters of ABC had asked me the same question about 10 years ago and gave me a photo. And I said this young man was not arrested and did not get hurt because the tank stopped in front of him and refused to crush him. And Barbara also gave me the name of who she believed was the young man, although I may have forgotten the specific name, but I asked people who were working with the public security agencies to use all of their networks to check out the whereabouts of that young man. And after a month-long investigation, I could say for sure that this young man has not been arrested. Did a part of you admire his courage. Well, anyway, In fact, I've never met this young man, although we're trying to search out his whereabouts, but we do know that he was never arrested. I do not know where he lives now in China, but looking from the picture, I know he definitely had his own ideas. But whether his ideas were correct ones, uh, that's an entirely different question. I cannot tell for sure who and what had influenced him. You haven't answered the question, Mr. President. Did, did a part of Zhang Zemin Admire, admire his courage. Now, I know what you're driving at. But what I want to emphasize is that we fully respect people's rights to freely express their wishes and desires. But I do not favor any flagrant opposition to the government's measures during an extraordinary situation. The tank stopped and did not run over the young man. Even under extraordinary circumstances, our troops remain very rational and reasonable. I'm not going to get an answer, and I understand. But I'm not talking about the tank. I'm talking about that man's heart, that man's courage. That man, that lonely man, standing against that. You were a student protester. Back in the Shanghai days. I can see that perhaps you, Zhang Zemin, would have done the same thing at that time. Before 
That was before you joined the Communist Party. That, that's what I'm asking. In 1943, I was still in Nanjing, attending university. The Japanese had occupied many parts of China, including Nanjing. The Japanese wanted the Chinese to get addicted to opium. So we launched an anti-opium movement and smashed many opium houses. When we confronted the Japanese military who were pointing their bayonets and guns at us, we sang our protest song, Arise, my fellow classmates, and defend the motherland. Do you take opinion polls to find out what the Chinese people are thinking? We select a group of people, a sample, to ask their opinion. And we try to know what they're thinking. And uh, also, we also make the conclusion based on scientific methods. But so you poll just the way Bill Clinton polls? Well, I also have personal contacts and keep in personal touch with the people. Do you, today, Mr. President, do you still believe that the United States bombed your embassy in Belgrade on purpose? Well, let me put it the other way around. The United States has state-of-the-art technology. So all the explanations that they've given us for what they call a mistaken bombing are absolutely unconvincing. You don't believe that? What, what would the United States get out of bombing your embassy <coughs> in Belgrade? So is that for me also a question? Yes, you wouldn't. Because you have such state-of-the-art technology and a sophisticated military command system with advanced radio communication equipment. And also, the identification marks for the Chinese embassy in Belgrade were too clear for people to miss. So, why did this happen? I it's still a question. But we still are adopting an attitude of looking forward to improve China-U.S. relations in the new century. I understand that. And that's behind us. But, but, you know, it's possible for the CIA and the Pentagon to make mistakes. Stupid mistakes. <laughs> the American people, the American people have no doubt, no doubt in their mind, I think, that this was simply a mistake. Your planes would not bomb one of our embassies. Can you imagine if a Chinese plane bombed one of our embassies? There'd be hell to pay in America, as there was hell to pay in China. But I... Why would you want to bomb an embassy? Why would we want to bomb an embassy? What message are we sending by bombing the Chinese embassy? Why don't you just say, you know something? It was a, it was a, it was a mistake. It was an accident. After the incident took place, President Clinton called me on the telephone several times, expressing his apology to me. And I said to him that after the bombing in Belgrade of the Chinese embassy, the 1.2 billion Chinese people, they all stood up in an angry roar against that incident. And I said to the president, uh, to your president, though we have a very big population, we still highly cherish each and every Chinese life, which we believe is all too too precious. We lost three lives in that bombing. And I said to him, it's not easy to guide the feelings of 1.2 billion angry people towards sensibility and good reason. And since you represent the Americans, just as I represent the Chinese, it would be impossible for us to reach total agreement on this issue. In 2002, Mr. President, you are through with this term in office, yes? That's right. My term for the presidency will end in 2003, and for general secretary in 2002. 2002, 2003, are you going to... Do you intend to give up any of your three posts? Oh, you ask very sharp, tough questions. Well, I'm afraid I can't give you a definitive answer today at this moment. 
because what will happen will be decided through our democratic system. It all depends on what the entire Chinese people and what the entire membership of the CDC will say. Anyway, we have to make sure that stability is maintained in such a big country with 1.2 billion population. I'm convinced that this interview will be further promoting the friendship and the mutual understanding between our two peoples. That is all. You believe that? That's right. I'm convinced that. I trust that. You admire America? That's right. And you want to be friends? I want to promote the mutual understanding.